Thank you for joining us today. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, welcome to our webinar. We are going to be discussing the BBB standards for charity accountability today and how meeting them can benefit your nonprofit. Um, we do have a lot of information to get through today, so I will be as brief as possible, and um, hopefully we can have some time for questions at the end. Uh, my name is Heather Leyland, and I am the Charity Accountability Program Manager here at the Education and Research Foundation of the BBB of Metro New York, and I will be co-presenting with um, Zoe Johannes, our Charity Accountability Program Associate. So, um, as most of you know, on the BBB Foundation, um, our mission is to be a leader in advancing marketplace trust by upholding and recognizing ethical business and charity standards and practices in New York. We fulfill our mission by providing charity accountability reports and also by providing capacity building educational programs throughout the year, not just for charity leaders, but also for business leaders and consumers. Um, by providing these programs, we hope that it helps you to enhance your performance and impact and meet high standards. Uh, we are also a nonprofit like yourselves um, with a 501c3 designation, um, so we do hope that um, you find today's presentation helpful. Um, and this, um, again, is brought to you by the foundation of the BBB um, here in Metro New York. So our charity reporting program has approximately 58 in the entire system nationwide. Um, together, we report on about 11,000 charities, both internationally and nationally and regionally soliciting charities. Our national organization is the Wise Giving Alliance, and they produce about 1,300 reports um, for charities that solicit nationally. Here in Metro New York, we produce about 100 
reports on locally soliciting charities. Um, and we are one of the largest in the nation um, for locally soliciting charity reporting. So why do we do charity reporting? Um, we do it because donors asked us to, and we've been doing it for quite some time. Um, our programs began in the 1920s, and um, the most current standards were formulated in 2001 and rolled out in 2003 when a BBB entity merged with an organization known as the National Charities Information Bureau and became the Wise Giving Alliance. Our standards uh, were developed by a national panel of experts based on research about donor information and needs, um, and they encompass four general areas. We look at governance and oversight, financials, um, whether a charity measures its effectiveness, and fundraising and informational materials. Um, how a charity communicates with donors uh, and how their um, donations will be used is crucial and is one of the core reasons that our program was founded. Um, the same panel of experts also recommended uh, three practices that include diversity and pluralism. And they strongly recommend adherence to the law, which when we say that, we're basically talking about our governance practices in standard one. Um, prioritizing openness and ethical behavior is also essential. Um, you know, being a nonprofit, we're called on to adhere to even higher standards that, than what's required by the law or by our own standards. Um, going beyond this um, is required to represent transparency. So it's just something to be mindful of. Um, and again, it's a recommended practice. So the guiding concepts for BBB standards, um, standards do not result in ratings. Um, this is a common misconception. Uh, we look to see if a charity meets our standards, and then we report to the public on whether or not that organization meets them. This process is completely voluntary. Um, information is given to the BBB that is not necessarily public information. So not everything given to us gets published. It's just um, the documentation we use to determine whether you meet certain standards. Um, <clears throat> in terms of financials, we prefer to look at um, audited financial statements because, over the 990 because they are GAAP compliant, uh, meaning that they're compliant with generally accepted accounting principles. Um, and this provides more consistency in financial reporting. And we want to look at the accuracy of the way you report um, and use your donor money. Um, accuracy in how a nonprofit communicates its fundraising practice is also key. So it goes back to the fact that accountability is more than just financials. We're looking at these four areas collectively, and that's what determines um, our BBB standards. So what is the benefit to donors? Um, going to our website and being able to confirm that a charity is accredited or meeting certain standards, it's a very quick way for um, a donor to understand um, where a charity is at, to verify that they meet these high standards. And especially if they have the seal, um, they recognize that seal. And it's a valued trust mark that um, donors feel comfortable with. Um, while the reporting process is free, and um, you know when you submit information to us and we develop a report, there's no cost for that. However, um, licensing the BBB seal is a privilege for charities that do meet all 20 standards, in which case you can license it to use on your marketing materials. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But the purpose of this webinar today is to explain how you can meet those 20 standards um, to show donors that um, you meet those standards. Um, the benefit to charities, um, going through the process um, is a really great way for a charity to have a checklist of their good due diligence on their processes in place for managing itself and interacting with donors. Um, it's a really good way to see if you're already doing the things that, that we ask for or whether you need to work towards accomplishing those things. So it's a really great audit, again, of your internal practices. And to go through that process is completely free. Um, the added benefit, of course, is the optional licensing of the BBB seal, which you can use on your website and any fundraising solicitations. 
it's um, based on a sliding scale fee according to your publicly solicited contribution amount. But again, that's optional and not really the focus of today's webinar. So being BBB accredited, um, we do have studies that show um, results of accreditation. We partnered with the Baruch School of Public Affairs and Professor Greg Chen, who looked at all of our data for charities who met standards and those who did not. And his key findings were that um, those who met the 20 standards, um, there was a correlation between those who met and those who didn't. And those who did, um, nationally, those charities, so, I'm sorry, um, Locally, those charities saw a 13.5% increase in their fundraising revenue, while those national charities saw an 8% increase. You can read the full text of the study at the URL located on this slide. And we will be sending these slides after the presentation, so no need to write them down. You will have full access to these and all the URLs that we will be providing. In addition to the Baruch study, there was an independent um, survey done in 2014 by an organization called Able Altruist, and um, they surveyed donors, um, almost 4,000 of them, and their key findings were that at least half of those uh, donors said that they do look for, um, for charity, uh, for different seals on charity websites. Um, over half said that the seal greatly or moderately increases the likelihood of their giving, and the BBB's um, logo was at the top of that list um, as being an influencer in their decision. And again, you can read those details um, at the URL located on this slide. All of the information we will be discussing today uh, can be found on our website at ny.give.org. Um, it's a great resource for you and your staff, so um, please do uh, feel free to search our website and let me know if you have any questions about that. And uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to Zoe. Thanks, Heather. So first I'm going to discuss which organizations are the type that we typically review. We are focused on organizations that are more than three years old, organizations that are publicly soliciting donations, and this does include government grants, charities with $250,000 in donations revenue, or organizations that are in the news or otherwise of interest to the public. And the reason we have these thresholds is we understand that if a charity may not be getting most of its money from public donations, a lot of our standards may not apply. If organizations are less than three years old, uh, they may not have the capacity to meet some of our standards yet or if they are so small that some of our standards may actually prove to be more of a burden to them to meet. We understand that, however, we will always um, report on a charity that requests a review. It's an entirely voluntary process, and any organization may request that we do a BBB charity report on them. The reporting process starts when you download the questionnaire, which is available at newyork.bbb.org slash participate. It's that URL at the bottom of your screen. Um, downloading the questionnaire gives us uh, a place to start your report, but we also ask for a bunch of backup documents, such as your 990, your most recent audit, your privacy policy, and more. We then evaluate the charity on the 20 BBB standards. After our initial evaluation, we will send the organization a draft report and a letter that details our findings and also discusses options for how you may be able to meet missed standards in the future. After that, we give the organization uh, about two weeks to respond to our findings. We won't publish a draft without first um, making sure that we've considered your feedback and heard back from you. And we also want to work with you. So even if you do not initially meet standards, we will try to see if there are any actions that you can take which could help you do so in the future. We will always send a final report before publication and then finally the BBB charity report will be published and available for public view on the BBB website. I'll next talk about our BBB standards. Standards 1 through 5 have to do with governance. Starting with standard one, this whole governance section of the standards is seeking to ensure that the board provides adequate oversight. Adequate oversight includes, but isn't limited to, board approval of the budget, of fundraising practices, contracts, and major expenses. 
the board must be receiving copies of the 990 and all fundraising contracts. Accounting procedures must meet generally accepted accounting principles. There must be scheduled appraisals of the CEO's performance at least every two years. And a voting board member should be overseeing the organization's finances. We can't give legal advice, but in general, a conflict of interest policy is also required for all charities. There are new procedures to follow and legal requirements about what elements need to be in a conflict of interest policy. Um, the new New York State Nonprofit Revitalization Act spells out these mandates and procedures for a lot of these government governance practices, and sometimes they will vary by charity or by size. So you should review the law to understand exactly how to come into compliance with those. We will refer all of um, our attendees to the actual source of the law, the URL, is at the slide at the very end of the show, and we encourage you to look at that directly. I also want to note that standards one and four are linked. Standards four is to do with board compensation. Uh, standard one stated there needs to be a board member overseeing the finances, and there also needs to be a board chair. I just want to clarify that they may not be the same individual. There must be two separate people carrying out the board chair and board treasurer roles. In addition, the board chair and the executive director may not be the same person, regardless of whether or not they are compensated by the organization. If a paid CEO or a senior executive acting as a CEO, maybe not with that same title, but is serving as the chair, the organization could potentially not meet both of these two standards for the same reason. It could fail standard one because the chair and the CEO is the same person, and then also fail standard four because the chair is being directly compensated as the paid CEO. I also just want to mention that our understanding is that effective of January 1st of this year, the Nonprofit Revitalization Act may require that the board chair cannot be the CEO, executive director, or any employee of the nonprofit. Again, please refer to the Charities Bureau website at the end of the presentation for additional information about that. Standard two is that a board of directors must have a minimum of five voting members, so we ask for your board roster to confirm that. Standard three states that there must be a minimum of three evenly spaced meetings per year of the full governing body with a majority in attendance required. If the organization has more than three meetings taking place, we'll choose the three meetings with the best attendance to determine whether there were at least 50% of members there. Executive committees or other type of committee meetings don't count. They must be full board meetings. However, a conference call can substitute for one in-person meeting and a video call such as a webcam or use of Google Hangout or another means where there is an audio and visual component where everyone can both see and hear each other may be counted as a face-to-face -face meeting. Standard four, as I touched on before, states that not more than one or 10%, whichever is greater, directly or indirectly compensated persons may serve as voting members of the board. So directly compensated board members are receiving compensation in any form, such as cash payments or in kind. So this could include benefits, such as health insurance or specialized skill or service. Indirectly compensated refers to members of the board who have direct family members who are directly compensated individuals. And this includes both board and staff. Standard five states that no transaction in which any board or staff members have material conflicting interests with the charity resulting from any relationship or business affiliation. With this standard, we are checking to see that any related party transactions were being held at an arm's length. Some things that we'll look at was whether the organization sought competitive bids, whether the related party was excluded from voting in the board vote. It's recommended that boards to take an active role in determining whether a related party transaction is fair, reasonable, and to the best interest of the organization. Furthermore, New York State law has really specific requirements touching on conflict of interest policy requirements, the procedures to follow in case of a related party transaction, and board member independence. All treaties should review these requirements in order to make sure that they are in compliance with them. This is also a disclosure question when it comes to the IRS's full length 990. It's increasingly important to avoid anything that may look like a conflict of interest that you would have to explain in your public tax return. Generally, if an organization is conducting substantial transactions with a board member or a staff-related firm and didn't take any steps to ensure an arm's length transaction, they will not meet this standard. 
and I'm going to pass it to Heather for measuring effectiveness. Great. So our standards 6 and 7 are regarding how a charity measures its effectiveness. Um, our standard 6 states that a charity should have a board policy of assessing no less than every two years the organization's performance and effectiveness and of determining future actions required to achieve its mission. Um, this standard is, I'd like to be really clear about this standard because unfortunately this was our most missed standard in 2015. And it's really not something that should be missed. Um, the reason that we ask for um, a board policy is because um, it's intended to help an organization determine whether they are meeting their mission goals. It's not about organizational goals or program goals. It's what are you doing to meet your mission. Um, the standard seeks to help organizations continue to conduct these assessments periodically, no matter who's in charge or what staff changes have taken place. The two-year requirement is intended to encourage organizations to timely identify necessary course corrections if they need to do so. So again, this is a board policy. It's, um, you know, a lot of charities may be already doing these things, but it's just not a voted and approved policy of their board. But it should be, and that's why it's um, a requirement for standard six. Um, specifically, what this standard calls for is that in the policy itself, it um, asks that the charity actually clearly identify measurable goals and objectives, including what process they're going to use to evaluate the success or impact of their programs to fulfill the mission. It always comes back to the mission. Um, you know, as a BBB, we seek to confirm that this assessment is carried out, but we don't seek to evaluate the quality or the content of this assessment. We just want to know that you're doing it. So we'll ask to see a copy of the policy, but um, the contents are completely up to you in terms of, you know, what you would use as metrics to determine if you are meeting your mission. Um, having this as a board policy confirms that the board is committed to doing this. Our standard seven um, is regarding the written report. Um, our standard says that the governing body should review and approve a written report of that aforementioned effectiveness assessment against mission goals and recommend, recommendations for future actions. Um, a little known fact is that your strategic plan may in fact um, be sufficient to meet the standard if it has all of those components already in it. So if you have you know, everything listed here in this slide, um, and that's part of your strategic plan, and you're doing it every two years, that's okay. Um, we don't care what it's called as long as it's being done. And again, we don't ask to see a copy of this report. We just want to know that you're doing it. If for whatever reason you're not, um, you know, some charities, maybe they give this report verbally or they use their board minutes to recount these things. Um, we have this tool um, to provide to those charities. Uh, we have partnered with Independent Sector and GuideStar to create these five questions, um, which are it's basically an impact tool that it doesn't take the place of a full evaluation. However, if you were to fill this out um, and submit it to your board, it could satisfy standard seven. Um, it's a great way to get um, you know, your team and yourselves thinking about what you can do to measure your effectiveness um, and get that into a written strategy that you can present to your board. And now over to Zoe regarding our financial standards. Thanks, Heather. So standards 8 through 14 are financial standards, but only standard 8, 9, and 10 set target spending ratios. These are ratios that were determined by a national panel of experts within the past 10 years. Now, BBB in June 2013 joined forces with GuideStar and Charity Navigator to launch the Overhead Myth campaign at overheadmyth.com. In an open letter to the donors of America, we declared that the overhead ratio is not a viable indicator of nonprofit performance. It isn't a score, and it shouldn't be used like one. We ask that donors really consider the whole picture when they look at a nonprofit and look to make a donation. Then as a follow-up, in 2014, we issued a letter to the nonprofits of America asking them in turn to be transparent and honest about the true cost of fulfilling their mission because it's important to really educate funders about the real cost of results. The overhead myth was important because 
we wanted to stress that an overhead ratio is not a good indicator of nonprofit performance on its own. Other factors need to be taken into account, such as transparency, governance, leadership, and results. As a full picture, charities need to be keeping overhead spending at reasonable levels, but it's not the only thing that means a nonprofit is doing good work. It's important um, to note also that about 89% of the Metro New York BBB charities are meeting the program and fundraising ratio standards. Only 11% or less are not meeting them. And often there's something behind this, whether it's, um, you know, a special campaign or something going into it. And media government and donor interest in these expense ratios is very high. These ratios don't tell the whole story, but they are a piece of it, and they're an important piece to tell. Standard 8 regards program expenses, asking that program expenses be 65% or more. So to determine this, we take the total program expenses from the previous financial audit and divide it by the total expenses, and hope that this is at least 65%. There's a common misunderstanding about what is and isn't a program expense, but even so, relatively few charities don't meet the 65% mark. However, um, we do, as a part of the standard, look to make sure that um, not all and any overhead expense is allocated to programs. We consider it completely legitimate to include allocations of expenses such as salaries, rent, etc., to a program, but only as so long as you can document and substantiate the proportion attributable to a program is reasonable and appropriate. You can look at our implementation guide online for more details about how we look into this, um, which there will also be a link at the end of the PowerPoint. But other expenses belong elsewhere. For example, staff time or resources that were used for fundraising purposes or for general management administration need to be allocated to those categories instead. We do not offer strict guidelines about what allocations you should use. We simply ask that you do it in a reasonable and transparent way that can be substantiated. Standard nine. Well, there we go. Standard 9 asks that 35% or less of related contributions are spent on fundraising. So to get this value, we take the total fundraising expense and divide it by the total related contributions. So only the total amount of donations that are listed in the past um, fiscal year's audit. Things that we look at for related contributions are including but not limited to donations from individuals as well as donated goods, in-kind contributions, government grants. I also want to pull out a few of these that may have to do with special situations. Membership dues, for example, may be considered donations if member benefits are minimal or non-existent. Also special events revenue bring up some special situations, amounts that are attributable to direct donor benefits such as meals and entertainment for events, are not considered fundraising expenses. But other expenses, such as printing, promotion, design, all related to a fundraising effort or connected to an event, are considered fundraising expenses. We will ask you to disclose and break out the event gross revenue, fundraising costs, and donor benefit costs excluded from fundraising expenses if this isn't clear in your financial statements. Do not report that event revenue net of costs and financials in order to create an inaccurate appearance of lower fundraising expenses. Also, government grants and contracts. We do count government grants in this category of related contributions, but not contracts. We will ask that your financial statements break out this amount. Also, sales revenue. If sold expressly for stated fundraising purposes, the revenue from a sale of some items might be considered contribution. If a fundraising goal is not specifically stated in connection with the sale of an item, it's not a contribution. So we just want to make sure that you are aware of how we're calculating your contributions and that you are looking at your fundraising expenses correctly. Also in-kind donations. Um, these would be services that you would usually have to pay for or specialized goods. For more details on exactly what constitutes an in-kind donation, we suggest you see the Statement of Financial Accounting Standards. Um, the fair value measurement, which is here at the bottom of the screen in the last bullet point. Standard 10 has to do with the accumulation of funds. We look to see that the unrestricted net assets available for use are not over three times the last year's expenses 
or three times the size of the current budget. When calculating this amount, we do not use fixed assets, and we also do not count donor-restricted funds. Even if an organization is over the limit, there are still measures that can be taken to meet this standard. We ask that any organization with more unrestricted net assets than that simply disclose this information in all direct mail, marketing materials, and websites. For information on how you can do that, um, we suggest you go to the implementation guide. And the reason for that really is that unless informed otherwise, donors are really expecting that their contributions be spent on current programs. We want full disclosure to make sure that no donors are being misled about where their money is going. Standard 11 has to do with availability. We ask that you make available to all on request your complete financial statements in accordance with GAAP principles. So to be in accordance with GAAP principles, organizations with over 500,000 in income per year, we ask to see a full CPA audit and ask that that is publicly available. Between 250 and 500, a CPA reviewed financial statement is fine, and under 250,000, an internally prepared statement will do. And we also check the auditor's cover letter to make sure that the audit is clean and unqualified. Standard 12 asks that in the financial statements, there is included a breakdown of expense by program, fundraising, and administration. If there are multiple programs within your organization, we ask that they are broken out at least by major category. This is what a functional breakdown of expenses looks like. Um, as you can see, we have a column for each program, fundraising, and administration. Be sure that your charity is not underreporting your program expenses or overreporting them for that matter. Your financials are really a fundraising representation and they need to be accurate. Some of your expenses that are often thought of as overhead may actually be program expenses and if you can document and substantiate that this is the case, that's fine. We just want you to be prepared to show that any expenses allocated to programs actually belong there. This is important because this is really a great management tool for your staff and your board. It tells your financial story. It shows that you are looking into how much you are spending on each area of your organization. Right now, this is a gap requirement for health and welfare organizations, but it's definitely possible that this will be a requirement for all nonprofits in the future. You can see some proposed changes to the FASB regulations um, for more information. And furthermore, this is already a part of your IRS Form 990. Page 10 includes this breakdown, so it shouldn't be too much of a stretch to have this in your financial statements as well. Then 13 has to do with accurately reporting joint allocations. The biggest problems we see with complying with this standard include incorrectly claiming zero fundraising expenses or misunderstanding the true amount that a charity is really spending on fundraising. Reporting zero fundraising virtually guarantees that the standard will not be met. Um, there's pretty much no organization that does not have some kind of fundraising cost, even if it's relatively small. There's also joint costs, which can be improperly allocated. An example of a joint cost is when an organization has a direct mail appeal that will also include activities related to programs, usually in the form of a public service message. This is really common. Charities with such joint allocations of expenses just need to be sure that they are appropriately and reasonably proportioned. And they shouldn't try to minimize the fundraising costs by overinflating the program costs. This is important because um, this involves many activities that have to do with education or advocacy. The main things that we look at are intent, audience, and content. If the content is a call to action other than just sending a donation, it could easily have something to do with program. As long as this isn't exaggerated and all of your functional allocation can be substantiated, this should be fine. But for details, we encourage you to see the AICPA Statement of Position 98-2. Standard 14 has to do with the budget. The budget must be board approved, and it also must contain those same functional expense categories of program, fundraising, and administration, exactly like the example I showed in Standard 12. So this, for example, is a budget that would not meet BBB standards. Even though it's extensive and shows a number of expense line items, it doesn't really show which portion 
one could allocate to programs, to administration, and to fundraising. And as a management tool, how are you to know how much of your revenue coming in is going to each of these categories and how you're allocating your money? This instead is a budget that would meet our standards. As you can see, it's very simple, um, but it still contains the totals for each of the, the organization's three programs for fundraising and administration. Unlike the previous example, you can clearly see how much money is going to each of these categories, and they're very easily identifiable. The Wallace Foundation, along with Fiscal Management Associates, have created a free library of resources and tools that can help your organization to become fiscally fit and meet with our standards. This tool in particular um, is a budget template that is a downloadable Excel sheet that can be very useful in transforming whatever you may have as a budget into a functionally allocated version that you can clearly see which percentage of each line item is going to your programs, your admin, and your fundraising. And now I'll turn it back to Heather for our fundraising standards. Great, thank you. Um, I'd also just like to remind attendees that if you have any questions, um, please feel free to type them into the box um, located on the right side of your screen in the little box below. Um, it looks like we may have a few minutes at the end to address any of your questions, so um, please feel free to do so. Um, so our fundraising section of the standards um, are 15 through 19, and these five standards um, are the heart of why we do charity reporting. Um, our standards revolve around the relationship between your organization and the, and the public. So these standards seek to make sure that your solicitations and information are as accurate, complete, and transparent as possible. Standard 15 and sorry, um, encapsulates what all of these standards are about. Um, Standard 15 requires that all solicitations and informational materials that are distributed by any means be accurate, truthful, and not misleading, both in whole and in part. Um, increasingly, the Charities Bureau has been looking at claims that mislead donors. So for this reason, this is especially important. Um, you know, sometimes even the best intentioned charities may fall off the wagon for reasons like their fundraising folks aren't talking to the communication folks or the attorneys or the CEO. So it certainly doesn't pay to be siloed in this area. You really want to make sure that uh, you're being as accurate as possible. Um, we know from research that this is what donors are most concerned about, um, that their donations will not be used in the way that they intend it to be. Um, and regulators care about this too, about whether you're accurately reporting to the public and how you're spending their money. So for example, um, if you are talking about impact stories, you want to make sure that they're not dated. You want to use um, stories and photos that are up to date and accurate. Um, if you're using a stock photo, you want to make sure that it represents an actual um, client if you're saying it does. So if it's a stock photo of Little Susie, don't say, you know, your donation will go to Little Susie. It's actually going to children like Little Susie. So it's little things like that and nuances that you need to be careful when you're making claims in your solicitations. Um, especially if it's something like, you know, 100% of your donation is going to go to such and such program. Um, you know, that's, you got to be careful with that too because that reinforces to the public that charities don't need to spend money on administration to be effective. And we know this is not true, so you really have to be cautious in that area. Um, you know, so if you say it, be ready to substantiate it and say why it's true. So if you are fortunate enough to have your board pay for all of your fundraising expenses, that's great, and you can disclose that when you're saying that 100% of the donation goes to programs. So again, this is just the core of you know why we have these standards and why they're so important. Um, again, you know, accuracy and specificity. Um, the reason for this is to protect donors and your charity. You really want to make sure that uh, they know how the funds are going to be used. Um, and once again, you know, we have this slide in here just to remind you um, of the red flags. If you make any of these claims, like zero fundraising expenses, uh, we will look at your financials to make sure that that claim is backed up. So again, if you say it, just be able to prove it. Um, you And you also want to make sure that um, the statements you're making are not too narrow. 
you want to make sure that they're broad enough to encompass all possible uses if it's necessary and applicable to your situation. So it's just being very clear about these things. Our standard 16 is regarding the annual report. Um, now this standard was in our top 10 most missed list, both in 2014 and 15. So I can't emphasize enough how important your annual report is. Um, this is an opportunity for you to tell your fundraising story. Um, our standard says that you must have an annual report available on request that includes your mission statement, a summary of past year's program results, a roster of officers and members of your board, and basic financial information um, such as your expenses broken into the functional categories of administrative fundraising and program with ending net assets and income um, for the prior year. So these are totals that you can pull right out of your financials, get it from your 990. Um, it's very simple to pull all this information together. Um, and also your 990 could possibly qualify as your annual report if it includes all these components. But it, the 990 is not donor friendly, so you know it's in your best interest to create an annual report. Um, Again, you want it to be in a donor-friendly language. And you know we don't get hung up on titles. We don't need it to be called annual report. Um, it's whatever you want to call it, year in review, or you know, um, our organization story for 2013. Whatever that is, it's fine. Um, it doesn't have to be glossy or expensive. Um, it can be a simple one-pager. Um, that would be sufficient as long as it has all those components. Um, Online a digital report uh, is fine, and you don't even have to have them readily printable. Um, but as long as you can print it if someone requests it, that's fine. Um, what wouldn't qualify is if you had that information on you know 10 different pages on your website, and it wasn't easy to get it all in one concise um, document. That would not be acceptable. Um, so standard 17 is regarding our website disclosures. Um, this standard only applies if your organization's website is soliciting for donation by any means. And when we say by any means, that is, even if you don't have a donate button, if you are saying you can mail us a check or call us and make a donation, then you would be required to have these disclosures on your website. Um, and those disclosures that we require are all the information from the annual report. So those items that we mentioned, the financial totals, missions, service accomplishments, and board roster. You've got to have all of that. You need to have your mailing address. Um, this just solidifies your legitimacy. Um, PO boxes tend to scare donors. Um, we want to make sure that they know you are a real organization. Um, I'm sorry, your mailing address could be a PO box, but you just want to make sure you have an address on your website. Um, electronic access to your most recent 990 with an appropriate labeled link. Uh, you could post a PDF of the 990. It could be a link to GuideStar. Um, it's very simple, but it has to be there, and donors need to be able to find it. Standard 18 is regarding a privacy policy. Um, our standard requires that every charity have one. Um, it needs to provide an opt-out for donors at least once a year. Um, it needs to be clear and accessible so that any donor can find it. So if you know you have a search box and I have to type in privacy policy or go to five different pages and it's buried at the bottom somewhere, that's not easily accessible. We want people to be able to see it right away. Um, it needs to tell donors what information is being collected and how it will be used, um, how to contact them if they want to update information or change it. And it should also tell um, whether or not you share personal information outside of the organization, and also what security measures are in place. On this last bullet point, it's important to note that um, on occasion we'll have a charity say, well, you know, we use a third party vendor to collect payments, so we go by their privacy policy, or, you know, we refer people to their privacy policy. But that doesn't matter. Even if you're not processing payments, you need to have. Um, a way to tell donors how you're securing the other information you have. So if you're collecting their email addresses and their names and their mailing address, you need to make sure that that information is safe. And this is just a, a quick example of what that opt-out option could look like. 
a simple checkbox in an email or on you know, a direct mail piece that they can return is fine as long as they have that option to opt out if they choose to. And just a quick note um, regarding privacy and security, you know, um, charities are increasingly becoming targets for hackers. So we have these resources that we provide to you, and I just want to reiterate that you know it's extremely important that you take the time to reflect on what you have in process and what you could do to improve on it, um, and just take a moment to safeguard your data and make sure that your staff knows what to do with data as well. You don't want to be that charity that you know the news investigators find information in the trash bin behind your office. Like you want to make sure people know to shred things and what to do for uh, cybersecurity and um, things of that nature. Back to the standards. Um, our standard 19 is regarding cause-related marketing. Um, our standard calls for charities to clearly disclose how the charity benefits from the sale of products or services uh, that state or imply that a charity will benefit from a consumer sale or transaction. Um, when you partner with a business, um, this is known as commercial co-venture, um, and it needs to be accurately represented to the public, all aspects of that partnership. So basically what we want to, uh, to see is the who, what, where, when, and how of that transaction. So organizations um, should provide the actual or anticipated portion of the purchase that will benefit the charity the duration of the campaign, if there is one, and any maximum or minimum guaranteed amounts or any other limitations. Um, this information should be presented at the point of purchase and not after. Um, vague phrases like net proceeds will benefit children, that wouldn't be sufficient. It should, be, it should have the name of the charity. Children can meet anything. So what charity is benefiting from this donation? An example of a statement that would pass the standard is five cents will go to ABC Charity for every bottle of juice sold in September up to a maximum of $500,000. As you can see, this is very specific. Um, we know exactly how much money is being donated and up to what amount, and we know what charity is going to benefit. So these details are crucial at the point of solicitation, and they have to be there. Um, it's also um, law per the New York Attorney General that it should name any charity benefited, benefited um, give the mission if it's not obvious, and specify any consumer action. After several um, investigations into these commercial co-ventures, um, the New York State Charities Bureau took away five best practices and, you know, they did see a common theme in all these cases and they put this forward for charities just to be aware. Um, in addition to adhering to the law, these are things that they recommend. Um, what's really important to note here is that it, it goes above and beyond even what our standards call for, what they're recommending. For example, you know, ensuring that your transparency in social media is accurate and even telling the public how much you raised after the campaign is over. Um, again, not required, but there's certainly best practices, um, and you can never be too transparent with your donors. Our last and final standard is regarding complaints. Our standard states that charities must respond promptly to complaints brought by a local BBB or the Wise Giving Alliance. Um, a charity doesn't miss standard 20 because they got a complaint. They would miss it if they didn't respond to a complaint. So what we're looking for here is um, a charity looking for a way to make their donor happy. Um, typically, the biggest complaint we get is that charities, uh, somebody requested to have their, um, to opt out of a mailing list and the charity didn't do it. The quickest way to lose donor um, trust is by soliciting them when they don't want to be. Um, and why would you waste your money soliciting them if they don't want to receive information from you? So um, just being mindful of that, and you know, you don't want them to tell their friends, don't donate to this charity, and for something as simple as you didn't take them off your mailing list. So again, just responding promptly. Even if the situation can't be resolved, um, if you get back to us when we inquire about a complaint, um, that's what we're asking for here. So that wraps up our 20 standards. 
Um, I'd like to just briefly mention the top 10 MIST standards from 2015. Um, and as you'll notice, the effectiveness policy and the annual report were the top two. Um, and again, these are, these are standards that can be easily met. Um, and especially with the effectiveness policy, chances are your charity is already doing what needs to be done to meet the standard. And it's really just a formality to get that policy voted on by your board and tuck it away. Just have it there. Um, you know, that's all we're asking. So if you don't have this in place, it's something to think about um, and discuss it with your CEO, your executive director, and, and see, you know, if this is something that makes sense for you guys to do. Um, we really don't like to see charities not meeting this standard because we know their intentions are good and everyone's working towards their mission goals. So we just ask you make it official. Um, and again, annual report, simple document. Uh, you have all the information there. Just put it together. Make it easy for donors to find it. Don't make them hunt for it. Um, it's your financial story and your fundraising tools, so just have it available. Um, and again, the others are also pretty simple to me. And I'd just like to touch on really quick the um, board attendance um, has been an issue. And that's, you know, now we have um, the option for one of your board meetings to um, be by conference call. And also the in-person meetings might count if you guys do teleconference and you can see and hear each other. So um, please don't forget that and take, be mindful of that when you are planning your board meetings um, going forward. Um, these are just some resources we have for you. And again, we'll be sending the slides around. Um, you can view the 20 standards at any time on our website. And in addition to that, we offer an implementation guide, which is incredibly useful. It has um, even more detailed information about what we're looking for when we're applying the standard. So if there's any um, question about what you would need to do specifically to meet a standard, the implementation guide is a really great resource. And of course, the uh, New York State Attorney General Bureau's website. Um, complete regulatory information is located here, in addition to some very useful guidance tools. So um, please uh, bookmark that one. And I'd also just like to point out that um, regarding the New York State Nonprofit Revitalization Act, um, the Brute College has a wonderful, their library has a wonderful uh, resource that very clearly lays out key points, and they have a lot of um, developments regarding how the laws are changing and developing, and I just, I feel like it's a very useful resource that you can share with your team. And um, on that note, um, I would just like to remind you that if you do meet all 20 standards, which there's no, I'm sorry, no cost to go through the process, and if you meet those 20 standards, you do qualify to license our BBB seal, you can find the sliding scale uh, fee on our website. Um, and this is a program only available to those charities. Um, and if you choose to opt into that program, um, we do have a recognition program where we run, uh, this year we'll be doing four ads in three different papers. Um, the New York Daily News, the Philanthropy Edition of the New York Observer, and also the Metro during the holidays um, that recognizes their seal holders um, by name and their website address. And this is really great because it comes out in the spring, right around tax time, then again for the holidays. And um, should you license the seal, you can put it on your website, website and it would look something like this. Um, donors can click on that logo, and it will take them right to your BBB report so that they can confirm your accreditation and have that confidence in their giving. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to us. Um, our contact information is here. Um, we are always available to answer your questions. And um, I do hope that you all have found this very useful. I don't see any questions at the moment, but um, I can remain on the line for a few minutes in case anybody um, would like to type in a question. And um, with that, um, thank you all for attending, and we really do appreciate your time. And um, we will send out follow-up slides and this recording if you need to refer to it in the future. Thank you.
Um, we did have a question just come in about whether a charity should go through the review process every year. And um, I'd just like to clarify that once you have a BBB report, it is good for two full years. Um, and then you would have to go through the process again. So um, they are good for two years. Um, we do understand that it takes time to um, put the materials together so we don't have you do it annually. It's good for two years and you can um, update information at any time during those two years. 